Hello, Kids Art Tour people. How are you doing this week? Um, we're in the middle of our launch week. And if you don't know what launch week is, this box that I've been talking about since April is finally available for subscription. And last night, or yesterday, I can't remember when it was, but um, I shared with you the complete reveal. So you got to see what the November, December box is going to look like. And I have a little sneak peek for you if you missed it. So we're going to Japan and we're going to study the art by Hokusai and his prints. We're doing printmaking. We're doing um, projects on Kintsugi, which is repairing ceramic with gold, mm. bonsai trees. And we're going to do koi fish and talk about Mount Fuji. And so we're just really immersing ourselves in Japanese art forms and the beauty that's there. If you want to get more details, you probably just want to watch that live stream. But here is the sneak peek of all the colors and um, the items that I actually have right now. So I just want to let you know about that. We have a very special interview. If you notice, <laughs> there's somebody over here. Um, my very good friend Lauren is here with me and we're doing a little interview today. And before we get started, I just need to let you know that this is recorded because Lauren lives in Thailand and I'm in the US and we flip flop when I'm going to bed, she's uh, waking up. And so we needed to pre-record this for our own sanity, <laughs> but I will be watching this with you live. So I'm actually here, just not here. And if you have any questions, I will be there to comment and help you out. Um, so yes, Lauren and I are going to talk about art, beauty, and our nervous system. And it probably was not the word you thought would come after art and beauty, but I'm so glad that these things go together. Praise God. <laughs> and you'll find out why as we talk, why it's such a good thing, a wonderful thing that art and beauty can help our nervous systems. Um, so Lauren, my good friend, Lauren, and her husband, Luke Smallcomb, they have a therapy practice in Thailand and they help people recover from trauma. And I'm just gonna give you the floor here. I'm gonna switch us around here. There we go. Close up. Lauren, <laughs> would, you, would you go ahead and just share with us anything you wanna share about what you do and um, what you do in Thailand? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, me and Becky have known each other for years and this was an exciting thing to talk about because the intersection of the mind and body and nervous system and art and beauty is something that has been a growing interest for me and my husband in our practice. So um, we have a virtual practice in Thailand. We see people from all over the world and we help people recover from the effects of chronic stress and trauma on the body and mind, which is a lot of us because life is is complicated and difficult sometimes. And so, um, yeah, this is something that learning about how powerful beauty and art is a big form of beauty, what we call beauty, um, is just such a, it's been such a powerful thing for us. So we're, I'm excited to be getting to the details of it with you, Becky. Oh, thank you. And welcome, by the way. <laughs> um, so if you can walk us through a little bit of an education on what is trauma, anxiety, um, dysregulation, and uh, what happens to our bodies during this time? Anxiety is an emotion which mm -hmm. is characterized by an unpleasant state of inner turmoil and depletion. Siri thought I was talking to her. Hilarious. So, She's helping you out. Her off. <laughs> always listening to us, always wanting I to tell us. <laughs> I will jump in. I'm not sure how right Siri was. Usually she's pretty accurate. But um, what, how we explain this to people is this idea that, um, you know, the body and mind, we, we, we separate them, but really they're one. But just to help understand um, our mind, like our thoughts, uh, our beliefs, and our conscious mind, and then our body, um, are intended to experience life in a certain way. And when life goes outside of those bounds, so the circumstances that are in our life basically pushes us beyond what we are able to tolerate or um, not having the right resources or support or tools or capacity to handle a given situation can actually make it traumatic, 
even if the situation itself doesn't scream trauma like we might typically think of. And so it's anything that the body doesn't feel resourced to handle and doesn't have the supportive, attuned um, help of a caregiver, a friend, a supportive person to help you get through it. So it's experiencing hard things alone and it being too much too for too long, more than your body can handle um, is kind of a very general term of trauma. And many, many, many things can fall under that. Um, and what this does essentially to the body is it creates a, a dysregulated nervous system. And so if you think of something being regulated and being able to just flux with life and respond efficiently and fluidly, the dysregulated nervous system kind of um, gets really wonky and the, the bodily responses are because of this underlying chronic stress and trauma on the, the systems of the body. And the nervous system controls all the systems, so it kind of impacts everything. Um, and when that happens over many years, because many times things accumulate, and um, that long-term effect can tend to really cause a lot of problems um, with your emotional health, mental health, and your physical health. Um, was there anything else in that question? Um, no, I, I think... I think you covered that. Um, I think. What does that look like in daily life? If you mm -hmm. are mm -hmm. in the moment, what does that look like for somebody? Yeah. So we, there's a term um, called the window of tolerance, and it's this idea that we all have a physiological threshold of what we can handle. And um, when you've experienced a lot of chronic stress, your window of tolerance becomes much smaller. And so this doesn't, this isn't your character, this isn't a morality issue, this is your physiological body is not able to respond to life's, um, you know, the ins and outs of days that are stressful and demanding and hard and frustrating. And uh, maybe grief ridden. There's so many things that come at the human in, in the day to day human experience. And when your window of tolerance gets really small from the effects of chronic stress and trauma, you uh, lose the capacity to to handle things just said really generally. So um, it can look different depending on the person and depending on the nervous system state you're in. So if you're in fight or flight, it might look like a lot of frantic, um, angry, frustrated angsty responses, irritability, um, pushing through, bulldozing over people, getting stuff done, and kind of losing your uh, connection to your true self in the process. Um, and then if, if the other main state of survival state is called shutdown. And this could look like kind of going into yourself and shutting out the world because it's too overwhelming and it's too big. And so shutdown is another way it could look like. It would look more like a depression or no motivation, no hope, um, no inspiration, no creativity, just kind of cut off from your true self in a, in a shutdown way. So those two, those are like the two main ways you can go up with like a lot of energy, not not good energy, but but anger and intensity and drive and stamina and just plow through life or kind of shutting down. Those are the two main responses that humans have. And it's very unpleasant. Yes. <laughs> yes. Uh, those are, I've never heard it explained that well, like. I feel like a lot of our homeschool parents at some level experience that feeling of just, I can't anymore. Or just when totally. you said that, that your window tolerance is just getting small, I will have moments where I'm like, who am I? And this should be, I could, should be able to handle this, but I am like through the roof inside, mm -hmm. just not able. Um, what is happening in our bodies when this happens? Mm -hmm. Um, um, we're in these states like physically. Yes. This, so this is uh, the, this part of the nervous system that controls this is called the autonomic nervous system. And so it's completely automatic, meaning it's involuntary. You're, you're not, you're not doing these things. Um, you're not making your body feel this way. Your body is responding to the environment in the way that it knows to at the moment um, and what its physiological capacity is. And so it's all on a, on a biological level that this is happening. And 
when you're in the fight or flight state of the hyper arousal, that's, that's another way, hyper arousal and then hypo um, when you talk about window of tolerance. So when you're in the hyper state, um, you have a lot of stress hormones that are kind of flooding your body. So this would be cortisol and adrenaline. And these stress hormones are really necessary for human survival, but they're supposed to be um, utilized when there's actually a need, a threat, right? And if you've been under the pressures of chronic stress for a long time, your body will interpret threat from everything. And so then these stress hormones are just, you're constantly flooded with them and they don't feel pleasant. Um, just like if you were to, you know, get in a car accident and then you pull over on the side of the road and you're, you're breathing fast and you're jittery and your heart is beating and your mind is racing and you're panicked. You're just gripped with panic. That's because something life-threatening almost happened. But that same physiological cascade can happen even when you're not um, at, at, you know, immediate threat or urgent threat and you, those processes are still happening in the body. So the systems, the hormone system is involved, the cardiovascular system, the endocrine, that's the hormone system, um, the, the musculoskeletal, so a lot the tension and pain your body holds is often related to the nervous system responding to these things that are uh, occurring in our lives and in our bodies. So um, yeah, you had asked what what's happening on like a biological level, right? Right. All <laughs> it sure feels like a lot <laughs> and sure it's true I've, so I'm, I'm going to share a little bit later but I was diagnosed with PTSD by three different therapists so it's a um, it, yes I have it had it and uh, it does feel like a roller coaster I've thought it's on a roller coaster I'm on a ride I can't get off um, no matter how much I pray no matter how many verses um, no matter how much calm music I'm sharing, you know, I'm playing, my body is just like, no, you're in danger, um, always. And, um, so yeah, it is, it is totally a, it took a long time for me to realize that I needed like brain rewiring. I needed something in that air that was really just physical. I was praying. I was trusting the Lord, but my body was just like, there's a bear chasing you. You gotta, you gotta run. And I'm sitting on my couch Still, my heart is just, and I've got this adrenaline. So anyway, I, yeah. Yes. Oh, a ride that you can't get off. Yes. Yeah. Descriptive, like poignant way to explain what it's like to be trapped in a body that's so dysregulated. Yeah. That's, uh, it's a heart, heartbreaking experience. It is awful. Um, so I think we've marinated enough in the problems. Problems. <laughs> What are some solutions that you bring um, to your trauma survivors? Yeah. What are some modalities that you found that are very helpful? Oh, oh so, so, many. <laughs> so many. There are so many. And, and that's why, you know, healing and recovering and, and rewiring your body and mind um, to be able to thrive in life and not, not just, you know, survive in that tiny little window of tolerance that, you want out of you that you want to be expanded. Um, there's so many amazing ways to do this. And uh, that's why we love this field because there's just beautiful people all over the world that are helping um, bring healing and restoration to so many people. So the, the ways that we have um, studied in and have experience in um, are in a more traditional therapy sense. And so it's it's recreating safety with a therapist um, and a coach. My husband is a clinical counselor and I'm a mind-body practitioner. And so we work together with people depending on what their presenting challenges are. Um, but recreating safety in your body is foundational to most all healing programs. The way that you go about doing that is the part that differs, where it differs. Um, and so, yeah, we we combine uh, trauma healing work, different ways of doing trauma healing with brain retraining and just see people have an amazing, um, we kind of think of it as like an unfolding or a, a um, just this un unraveling in a really beautiful way of what what's holding them 
um, kind of captive, what's keeping them on that roller coaster, like you said, and watching their body as it responds and knows um, there's a lot of wisdom in the body as we learn to listen to that deeper message beneath. Um, so that's kind of a general answer, but it's hard to capture everything. Um, what, what we the, the area we're talking about today is one of our, we have five pillars for healing. And I'll just say those quickly, acceptance, beauty, compassion, slowing down and embodiment. They're kind of ABCDEs um, with a little trick there for D, it's slowing down. Um, but beauty is uh, the, the pillar that invites people to a new way of engaging in the world because what happens is chronic stress and trauma kind of puts you in this little bubble where you can't really um, receive and bring in beauty into your life anymore. Things kind of get grayscale and uh, life loses its goodness because of these effects in your body. Your body shifted over to survival mode and survival mode is not concerned with beauty. Mm -hmm. But the cool thing is, is beauty in and of itself can actually help shift you out of that survival mode, out of that fight or flight or that shutdown mode. It can help bring you to a, a nervous system state, which is the human baseline state for flourishing and for um, being connected and happy and healthy. It's called safe and social. And this state, um, beauty can help us to connect to this state in a really powerful way. And so that's when we become more interested in it and more passionate about it and reading about the benefits of seeking beauty and all the different ways that you can seek beauty, art being a primary way of, of expressing and taking part in beauty. I am just tracking with you all the way. <laughs> I'm like, yes, yes, because when you're in those those moments, you, it's tunnel vision. That's how I think of it. You just, you can only see like, what do I need to do? And you, you really cannot enjoy. And because it's not important, like you said, like there's a bear chasing me. I'm not, Oh, look, look at those beautiful leaves. No, <laughs> I'm running and I'm, I'm, I'm shutting down every other thing that is not important. Um, yeah, exactly. So when you, you have to stop yourself and, and look around and find pretty things or just notice things. Um, yeah. I was really surprised when I started that, how much it helped. I thought I was skeptical. It's like, there's no way that doing these simple things will calm this monster, this raging monster down. But it, it does. I, I am a believer. I was skeptical. <laughs> um, so yeah, it's, it's really powerful. Um, so let's talk maybe more specifically, we're kind of talking general about experiencing beauty. Um, how do you integrate beauty into you, your practice or how, how do people integrate beauty in their lives commonly, yeah. daily? Yeah. What are we actually talking about? So um, what you were just describing when you started, it's we call, um, we use the word glimmer, which we didn't make up. It's actually part of that system I was just describing of the three different states. But a glimmer is what exactly what it sounds like, a little, uh, a little slice of beauty. And so um, inviting people, always an invitation, because our body wants to feel like it has power and like it has choice. That's really important for any recovery. Um, so when you start feeling the invitation to, I'm looking around my office, I'm looking at glimmers, um, to, to take part of a glimmer. So take in the glimmer, looking at the sunset or enjoying the, um, the funny cat video, or when you're walking on the grass, feeling your feet in, in the grass or gazing at, um, you know, something beautiful that you see, uh, like a, like a, like a statue or something out when you're out and about, like enjoying and appreciating goodness and beauty in the form of using your senses to do so, um, that glimmer can then grow. And the glimmer, taking part in the glimmer, sometimes it has to be intentional and almost um, you have to push yourself because you might not feel much at first, but then that that beauty, that little dose of beauty you got actually helps it grow bigger and then you'll seek more. So it's this very um, 
positive cyclical effect in the right direction of bringing in the beauty into your life. And so that's what we encourage people to do, you know, at their own pace, at a pace that feels um, maybe pushed a little bit, but but authentic to them, not not inauthentic. And it really starts to grow. Um, we've seen people use so many different forms of beauty to, to take part in so many different forms, um, really based on what they're interested in. And so we have a lot of clients who actually who will draw out um, experiences that they're experiencing on like a soul heart level. But when they put it into um, a drawing, it transforms that the expression of that reality that's kind of abstract when they make it concrete it um it's hard to state how powerful that can be for clients and we've had this happen many many times and they'll share it with us and they'll explain the significance and there's something very powerful about expression because one of the things that causes a big thing that causes that underlying dysregulation in the nervous system and body is suppression and suppressing our truths that we've experienced, suppressing our stories, suppressing our emotions. They've done so much research on what suppression of emotion does to the body and mind, and it's not beneficial. Mm -hmm. um, so that when we flip the switch and we start expressing, that's like the opposite, right, of suppressing, we start expressing these things whether it be through through writing or drawing or stories or poems or painting or whatever way the body, you know, you lean into that singing, um, it it releases and it it helps um, shift that that thing that was stuck inside that was causing so much dysregulation. It's really cool to watch. Hmm. So you can take pottery classes. You can just sit and draw for a few minutes Yeah, uh, in the moment, you know, mm -hmm. so I'm just thinking of moms with their kids and we're having a yucky day and we're really upset or feeling overwhelmed. What, five minutes drawing or just like everyone stop and let's just take mm -hmm. it easy. Let's go for a walk. What yeah. are some things that you might suggest? Yeah. In so we are very partial to nature um, we do live in Thailand, so that's a little bit unfair to the people who are in colder areas um, to just just pause, just pause and go outside and let that shift you. So even if it is cold, sometimes that brisk cold air can really um, kind of help shift your state a bit. But but using your senses to observe and to bring in what what your the sensory information around you and then even. A really neat thing with kids would be to to do that and then then to draw it to like get that out on paper to show what mattered to them in that like what they engaged with because you know it's going to be so something different for everyone their expression of that experience um so i think that's even if you miss work that's so powerful to just be like okay we are all wonky and dysregulated let's just take a time out and go outside for 10 minutes or let's just stop what we're doing and look at this picture book. Well, you know, something with beautiful pictures, some way to help um, get the the frontal lobe, which is our which is where our cognitive processes happen, back online, and the emotional brain not so reactive. Because when there's all that fighting and tension, that's coming from the emotional brain, and that's not. Uh, so much your thinking brain isn't isn't so much engaged at that point. So when you take part in beauty, it actually helps you bring in your cognitive brain and um, bring that integration to the brain, which helps you think more clearly, feel more, um, you know, feel more rooted in truth, not not so much just a reactivity. So those those things could be really powerful. Um, Anything that allows the, the body to get involved is is um, huge. So even like Play-Doh, like giving everyone some Play-Doh to, to play with or sculpt. Something that's tactile and using the body um, and the senses would be a great way to help shift in those hard homeschooling days, which we've had many in the different years we've homeschooled different children. That is so good and helpful and easy, easy to do. Like I would think 
you know, like I said before, like this is not going to calm my monster down, but it actually does. It's just, mm -hmm. um, and, and, uh, I mean, we've done it so many times, um, with my son one day he was really upset and wasn't even with me. And the person that was with him, he wasn't even with family, had him just draw. And it just helped him so much. And he came back with a drawing and he was all like regulated and he was fine. He was outside too. And he just went into that drawing mode, art mode, or just expression mode. And it it did it, did it for him in the moment. Um, he was very upset and just and was fine. <laughs> really? um, it was so powerful. And every time we, we give our body and we give our kids' bodies a chance to experience um, regulation in the midst of dysregulation, we're actually wiring their brain to become a more regulated person. And that's such a gift in childhood that um, actually benefits you the rest of your life. But those tiny little things that you're like, oh, we don't have time or it's not worth it. Let me tell you from a mental health perspective, it's totally worth it because that's finding safety and that's what the body needs to flourish. It needs to feel that sense of safety. And so when they, things feel out of control and life feels hectic and awful and big and overwhelming, and then you do that little activity to sh help support them in that, to help their body shift, and then they feel better, that just told their brain, you are capable you are empowered, you can find safety, you can be okay. And that message will, you know, repeated regularly, will carry with them until they are on their deathbed. That will be a, a foundational um, thing for their, their thriving as a human. So powerful. Um, I had a question and I was gone. <laughs> Oh, no, <laughs> no. Um, but I was going to go into like, okay, so I have a question for you. I'm going to be a terrible lawyer because I don't know what the answer is, but I'm going to set it up for you. So I had an aha moment like a few months ago, and I did tell you this about earlier, but I'll go into yeah. it. Well. So I was going to a therapist, um, actually loaded up because I got to the point where I'm like, I can't do this anymore. And this was somewhere around May or June. Um, okay. And it was well, it's around the time that I actually saw you guys too for a bit. So I, I was all loaded up with getting help, which was right and good. And I'm so glad I did. Um, but one thing uh, one of my ladies was telling me to do, I was very, I was not okay that day. And she goes, okay, so let's, we're going to do five, four, three, two, one. And the numbers don't really matter, but it kind of helps you walk through it. What are five things you can see right now? And I'm just like, oh my goodness, really? <laughs> I'm in danger and I'm upset and I'm, I'm dysregulated and I'm a mess and you want me to look around the room. So I, okay, I see the window, I'm sitting on my bed and I did the five things. Four things you can hear. And we just walk down our senses. Okay, I can hear the trees and you know, this is my space and this is where I'm at. I don't see anything chasing me, okay? And mm -hmm. the, you know, your body is realizing we're in a safe place, we're fine. And then it gets you out of that tunnel vision. Yeah. And if I was in a pretty place, it would have been like, oh, I see beautiful leaves. I see some flowers, sure. the birds. And then by the end, you know, you're doing your sense of taste and um, smell, which if you can't taste or smell anything, then I'm imagining what coffee might taste and smell like, <laughs> or, you know, chocolate, those things like that. And I had just gotten done telling her that I was flat emotionally. I'd been that way for weeks. I couldn't feel anything. I had like shut down emotionally. Yeah. When I got done within 30 seconds, tears, emotion just flooded. It was like, my body was like this. And then it finally went like that. And just all this stuff came out, which wasn't fun, but it was, wow. healthy. it was a good release. And then yeah. I was tired for the rest of the day. So that, that told me, cause I've done other things like that. And I had a major brain shift that day. Just doing that for 30 seconds. It was crazy. Mm. And then I'm like, okay, there's something to this. And I've also done, you know, the tapping and the somatic stuff. And that really helps too, amazingly. So about a week later, I'm realizing I just had this like, wait a second. That's exactly what I'm doing with my kids in live art tour. So if you watching have been to our live art tour, what am I doing with your kids when we look at art? What are you seeing in this painting? Mm. Um, what, what do you feel? How do you feel about this painting? Mm -hmm. 
feel happy or sad or touching our emotions. Okay, now you're in the painting. What are you feeling on your body? We, we go through all the senses in the same exact way. And I'm just wondering, as you in, put your, okay, this painting here makes me happy. I'm like, I need Monet this morning. If I'm here, I'm so happy. I'm sitting by the water. I've got my feet in the water. I can hear the water. I can hear the birds. I can feel the breeze. What is that doing to my body and mind um, when I'm doing that for myself, when everyone looks at art and, and engages in that way? Yeah. So. Yeah. Um, it's amazing. Since I've been practicing, I'm much, I can get there much more quickly now. It used to take time. But as soon as you started describing that scene, it like lit up like a movie around me. It's just like, oh, there we are. Um, and, you know, I was look, looking at it and then you describing even being by the water. Um, but it, it takes practice. Um, but but what, what it does for humans is, um, again, it connects you with that regulated state of the body which is called safe and social. And it, and it gives you, there's cute in life, there's cues of safety and there's cues of threat. Mm -hmm. And art and beauty are cues of safety for the body. Mm -hmm. When I talk about safety, I don't just mean physical safety. I mean, emotional, relational safety, safety that I am okay in the world, that my world is okay, that I am safe. I am competent. I am, I am able. Um, so as we, as we engage with beauty through art, we're, we're able to access that kind of um, empowered place of, of goodness through using our senses. And the way you do that going into art with the kids, like that's so brilliant and also teaches them to be more body aware because a lot of kids can't connect with what they feel about things. They just feel it and they're just in their feelings and they're, they're like a little tornado and a bunch of feelings they have no words for. They have no, um, they can't grasp, right? They're just in it. But when you, when you help do that, there's something non-threatening. Art is not threatening. So, you know, it's a bit harder when you're in a conflict with a child and you're trying to get them to talk about what they feel and all of that, but starting and building up those skills through something non-threatening like art is such a great way to create um, competency and literacy there. But I'm not totally answering your question. I'm just okay. amazed by this. You said, um, what What did you? What was your specific question? Remind me. Oh no. <laughs> no um, you what is too. happening there? Like when we, you know, this, I mean, I think you. I think you did answer it. You know, cycle like or physically what is happening when we're yeah. putting ourselves yeah. in those places of yeah in specifically in art but yes thank you Dave. so so something that's really cool about the brain is it doesn't actually differentiate if you're there or if something is imagined mm -hmm. um that is, is that is yeah. huge. It, it was very surprising to learn that in brain science but like about brain science, um, that that's why children's imaginations are so real to them because they're there, you know, they're, they're being the cowboy, they're, they're being the, the woman explorer, they're doing all of these things and they're really experiencing those feelings with it. That's why it's so fun. If you didn't feel anything, you know, if it didn't feel real, it wouldn't be fun. Um, but so using, using, allowing art to, to really engage with art, your, uh, in a sense, transporting your body there through the power of the mind, because the brain doesn't actually know if something you're imagining is you're imagining it because you're in it or you're just imagining it. There's no differentiation for the brain uh, experientially. And so utilizing that is actually super powerful. And it's, it's a shame adults stop using their imagination because uh, it can bring the brain uh, so much goodness that it doesn't it might not have a normal life. So say you're in an office and you know, you're, or you're stuck in a house. And, but if you can, if you can transport yourself through, through art and through visualizing and enjoying and taking part in that, um, that's giving yourself su such a big gift that you can take advantage of. Mm -hmm. Yeah. As you're talking, I'm just like, yep. It's amazing <laughs> to me that the visualization, which, which has been helpful to me too, visualizing a safe place, a beautiful place. Mm -hmm. We can use art to do that. 
is just as powerful. That was my last question for you. Like, what is the difference between looking around my room and putting myself in this painting? Yeah. There's, there's no difference. And right. really, I feel like the visualization can be more powerful. It, it can. can make happen whatever you want. You can. Right. <laughs> right. Dolphins and <laughs> you can totally. make it totally safe and beautiful. Mm. Um, it's so powerful. It's so good. Wow. wow. <sighs> and there was something else I was going to say, but now I can't remember. <laughs> it's There's just so much goodness. It's hard to. There, there was one thing um, that I, I do happen to remember, but I, I, it is nighttime for me. I didn't just wake up. So. <laughs> We'll say that. Um, I'm fresh and you're not. <laughs> that's too funny. Um, when you when you use the, the language, okay, so the language of the nervous system is a language of sensation. The nervous system doesn't um, communicate through verbiage, through words. That's the cognitive part of the brain, but the entire nervous system as a whole is a... Um, it speaks the language of sensation in our senses. And so to try and help bring um, regulation and support and stability to the nervous system, sensation is such a powerful way to do that. And, and using, um, using your body to experience things. And what we're talking about today is using, it's kind of using your mind and your body because you're using your mind to kind of bring you into the art and then your body feels all of these things. And that is so um, powerful for the body. Like we can't stress that enough of how, how helpful and supportive and healing that is for the body to be able to tap into beauty through through using the, the the sensations that our body was designed to have, the senses that we that we have, um, using them, tapping into them through through art, just is a really really neat and not hard way. Like it's not therapy; it's just being human and and learning to allow your um, your human body to enjoy and delight in what it is to be a human with senses that can appreciate beauty. Um, thank you. Wonderful. So my last question, which I think we've kind of touched on it quite a bit, but I just want to leave parents with a uh, reminder. What can you do in the moment? Mm -hmm. We've talked about a lot of things, looking around you, going for a walk, putting something on paper, drawing it out. Mm -hmm. uh, any other thoughts for in the moment? Um, regulating our, our kiddos and ourselves. Um, yeah. Um, so many thoughts about this, but for, sh for time's sake, uh, it is most helpful to be regulated yourself if you want to help regulate a kid. We as humans, we share our states. We're just little contagious state sharers. <laughs> like that's what we do. And so if you want to um, bring calm to a wiry, dysregulated, angry, irritable kid, you have to have that calm first. And so we're huge proponents of like going in a room, in a bathroom somewhere and helping yourself get to a place of more stability before you try to address the kid who's falling, you know, going out of control. Um and that takes time and work. And there's a lot of adults feel shame because they're like, why can't I be, why can't I do this? I want them to, but I can't, but they just need to because they're making me all wonky inside. And um, able, learning how to be able to do that yourself will gift your children the gift of your state, will help them regulate. It's called co regulation more than anything. So, it's kind of a trick question because it's like, well, what can I do for my kids? Well, what you can do for your kids is what you can do for you, right? Mm -hmm. And we've both seen that play out in parenting so much. Um, mm -hmm. So really, really nurturing that in yourself is profoundly helpful for parenting. And parenting is insanely difficult. So we need all of the help we can get. <laughs> yeah. I've been able to bring Landon down from complete, you know, overwhelm and like, in minutes doing some of these things amazing what do you see and we're bouncing a balloon back and forth so we're like the body and back and we're both sides of our body so that's a 
a defined reality. Yeah. Yep. What are you seeing? What are you hearing? And in like mm-hmm. like two minutes, by the end of that, we're laughing and so much yeah. better. Like, wow. That's you, wouldn't think, you wouldn't think, but it really is very powerful. Yeah. Touch is another one if they're if they're not angry, like if they're okay with touch in the moment. Um, foot massage back scratching, shoulder, some type of uh, safe touch, again, if they're receptive, can really disarm um, that feeling of threat and unsafety that causes so many behaviors. Yeah. Mm. This is such a wonderful topic. And I'm so glad we did this. It is. It matters so much. I will let you um, tell everyone how to find you, uh, website, all the things. If someone wants to reach out, I'm just going to say Luke and Lauren are 100%, 150% safe places, full mm-hmm. of grace for where you're at. Um, uh, I, I trust them very much and recommend um, any time spent with them. And also yeah. if there's anything else you wanted to mention. Thank you, Becky. Mm-hmm. That's like the highest um, compliment we could ever receive that we, that we care for people well and create that safety. That's just the best possible compliment we could receive. That means a lot to us. Um, So we are, uh, so our practice is called Flourish Therapy. So you can find us on our site, which has all of our contact information, flourishtherapy.co. You can find us on social media. We produce a podcast called Phil to Flourish, and that gets published every other week. Those are on YouTube and they're also on wherever you find your podcasts. We talk about all different types of mental health, um, mental health topics and trauma healing and regulation and relationships. So, um, yeah, we're on all of the social media platforms. There's so many and we're on all of them, most all of them. So you can find all of those things at our site under contact. It has all of those listed. But yeah, we we work with um, a lot of people and it's just uh, honestly the most rich and meaningful work for us that we could ever do. It's such a gift walking with people and watching them through this this process, this journey of becoming a more uh, more fully alive human for for who they are, their true self, and what who they're designed to be. It's, awesome so thank you for having me on to talk about this because this is this uh this broader topic of the body and mind and how how we heal and how we grow is so um it means so much to us and it's kind of our favorite thing to talk about and then applying it to different niches is just so cool because um art is just something that's so so powerful and and honestly has like if you look at memoirs or or stories movies and you hear like people have gone through a lot and you and you hear them say how did you survive i'd say eight times out of ten there's something they did that connected them to beauty that really saved their life in essence you know i'm talking about these big dramatic stories, but also the day-to-day you and me stories of, of surviving really hard things. Beauty makes us want to keep on enjoying this life and finding reasons to get up and to have hope again. And what a gift that is in such a hard, hard world. What a gift it is that you're offering to people and just that people can enjoy it. I love that we're made this way. How yes. cool that we're made this way. Uh, and I'm just, I'm sitting here like just so excited about what I am doing. Like it really does matter and it's going to make a difference. Um, it is important. It's not, it's not just right. pretty or, you know, pretty things. Right. It's so important. Yes. Well, thank you so much. I feel like we could go on and on. <laughs> we can keep talking. Right. <laughs> um, we're going to wrap up. Um, please contact Lauren uh, through their website. If you need anything, want to talk yeah. about and even just following on social media, we produce free content daily just to help you in your journey as you're growing as a human. So we'd love you to follow and learn along with us. Yes, please do that. Um, so tomorrow I am going live again, and we're going to actually talk about things that you can do with your family and how to engage in art. So we talked about the problem, uh, 
and solutions. And so then tomorrow we're going to talk specifically about what you can do with your kids to engage in art and you don't need an art degree to do it. So uh, I'm going to list off some things for you. So look out for that tomorrow. And um, thank you very much, Lauren. It was really nice to have you. Thank you so much, Becky. Thank you. So have a good rest of your evening and